Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to yet another uh, exciting discussion on all things well-being. My name is Dr. Kimberly Quinn, and my role here, which just gets me so excited, is helping people become the boss of their brain. Again, sort of synonymous with become the boss of your thoughts. And this is just works wonderfully with today's chat, which is about ants. Yes, like the little crawly things that have little antennas. No, that's actually an acronym for automatic negative thoughts, automatic negative thoughts. And it's so important to know what our own ants are because we have different ones. I mean, we're gonna, today we're going to talk about nine different ants. Some of them can go together. And uh, most of us, no matter how positive you are, how positive you think you are, how optimistic in general, um, even, you know, we all have moments when life throws a curveball or just like a toddler, we're hungry, angry, sick, or tired. And we, you know, we have the flu, we're certainly not, maybe not going to be our, you know, most optimistic self. And we can have these automatic negative thoughts roll through. And it's really important to know how to extinguish them. First, we have to know what they are. Okay, so before I go another inch, I want to do a shout out to Daniel Amen, author of The Mind Coach, uh, which is actually a children's book. He does a lot for grownups uh, with cognitive psychology and all things well-being and um, working hard to, you know, get the word out there that thoughts come first and feelings come second, right? Um, you know, which is our main main chat in Minecraft. And, you know, to, to help people become aware of, of negative thinking. And, you know, because once we're aware of it, it's then that we can, you know, you know, sort of do something about it to manage it. So Daniel starts out by saying, he says, everything starts and ends in your mind. How your mind works determines how happy you are, how successful you feel, and how well you interact with other people. The patterns of your mind encourage you toward greatness, or they cause you to flounder in mediocrity or worse. Learning how to focus and direct your mind is the most important ingredient of success. You know, I, I've used this this book for years with my Minecrafters, my, my college students, and um, I've actually got a professional development thing next week. We're uh, working with faculty, um, sort of like in a working with middle school, well, elementary, middle school, and high school students with different executive functioning issues and things like that because, um, you know, anxiety, the ants, what we're talking about, can just wreak havoc. Wreak havoc in anyone, if you're neurotypical, but cert or and certainly for the neurodiverse, anxiety can really throw a wrench in an already uh, different executive functioning system. So that's going to be loads of fun. So these these work for every for all of us. And now to know, remember that um, we can't do what we don't know, right? My very dear friend, Doctor Day says we cannot do what we don't know. And once we once we become aware, we become responsible. So this is true for ourselves, true if we become aware of something global. You know, it's like now there's no more excuse once, once we get it. When we don't get it, that's different. Once we get it, we have a responsibility to whatever it is. And in this case, we're talking about ourselves. And obviously, this also would affect our relationships. So the very first ant, A-N-T, automatic negative thought. And uh, the activity is drawing these ants. We'll get to that at the end. So ant number one is the all or nothing thinking. So this person who has this ant of all or nothing thinking thinks in very a very polarized way. Everything's, you know, it's all black and white. So uh, they might think, you know, oh, let's say a college student. If I get an A, well, then, I, then I'm doing well. I'm a great student. You know, I'm a, I'm a great student. And if I do not so well, poorly, uh, and I get a C, then that's it. I've, I've no good at all. Or God forbid, a, a, D, a D or an F then they're just the worst student ever. Even if it's one test or one paper or one, you know, project or something, it's just, it's, it's very, very extreme, ex extreme words. And I'll tell you that with my Minecrafters, I also have the terrible top 10, which we're going to talk about now that we just need to get rid of because they're polarized and not healthy for us to even have in our head. Okay. So ant species number two is the always thinking ant. So it's similar to the first one, but a little different. The first one uses like the polarized thinking a lot too. This one that uses a lot of the terrible top 10, like I'm saying to you. So I, I actually say to my students, obviously it's your choice. If it were me, I would delete all 10 of these words. 
out of my vocabulary. The first one on the list is disorder, and we could do the whole world a favor. Those of you who have heard my other episodes, Minecraft podcast episodes, know that I am no fan of that word. And I, if we could delete it from every language across the globe, we would be doing the world a big, huge favor because shame, sorry, disorder is a shame word which means that the word uh, has us feeling even more flawed and defective than the actual label does. It's ba ba ba, whatever's wrong, and then disorder. It's like saying you flawed, defective loser. It's a dumb word and it should go. Okay, so that said, I know, how do you feel, Kim? Okay, so, and then the next word after that is perfection. And that, that's self-abuse of just the highest order. And somebody famous said that, I just forget who. Okay, the rest of them are, uh, always, never, everything, nothing, no one, everyone, you know, just polarized words that just do not exist. And so one of the examples I use, I use just in, in a couple's uh, situation. So way back when I was therapizing, I mostly worked with uh, children and teenagers, a lot of ADHD work. And occasionally I would get the married couple because it was my, my turn on the list, right? So I, I would be often be met with, you know, folded arms towards each other and I would get, you know, folded arms. She never listens to me. He never listens to me. They never listen to me. Folded, folded arms. And, and so I would try to explain that even if it's the truth, it's, this is legit that the other partner is not listening the majority of the time. It's very important to use the appropriate words to describe how we feel because never the word never means every milli, millisecond of every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every month of every year of all the years of your whole life. And since we have to sleep, take showers, run errands, do other stuff, that isn't statistically possible, right? So if we change our words from, you know, you never listen to me to, again, it can be legit. Let's just say something else. We will say, we'll swap this out. Um, I'm feeling not listen to the majority of the time when you're home. You know, I'm really not feeling listened to most of the time. And, you know, that has me sad rather than never because never is like hitting a brick wall. The partner more than likely feels like, well, why bother? You know, it just doesn't for what? Okay. So ant species number three is focusing on the negative. So, this this person who thinks with the focus on the negative just skips skips by any good parts. They think, well, there's nothing good about this. Of course there is. Of course there is. So let's say we'll start with the mild here. Let's say you don't get the promotion and somebody who you didn't think had a fraction of the skill and talent you did got it. Maybe it's somebody's niece. And that just sucks, right? Politics are everywhere. Uh, it, but it also can't be maybe something better is down the road or Maybe since she doesn't really have any skills or he doesn't have any skills that they'll kind of land on their, on their butt kiss, you know, if they don't, if they can't actually do it for very long and then you'll rise to the top. If you just kind of stay out of the way, um, it could be a tough sell telling a family they have to move because mom got promoted or dad got promoted or mom and mom got promoted. And that's a tough sell for middle school, high school kids for sure. A partner who also loves their job. And that said, no matter how much it sucks, there's going to be positive someplace. Let's say moving to our tiny town where we're surrounded by gorgeous scenery and mountains at our little tiny elementary school, uh, they go skiing on Fridays during the, during the winter and the mountains right out, right out the door and it counts for gym, you know, bonus. So although that may not, you know, maybe a tough sell or not fix all the, the friendships changing and all that, Typically, there's something good happening, even, even when it's something that's hard. Uh, the, the extreme example is a funeral. I don't think anybody looks forward to funerals. And if they do that, that's, they might want to have a conversation with a professional, right? Because it's just strange. So we, don't, we normally don't think, oh, gee, I can't wait till the weekend so I can go to a funeral. Because typically, they're just sad and, and they can be, you know, act all in out tragic. People just don't look forward to these. And even so, as horrible as funerals can be, and I'll ask my Minecraft or college students this. I'll say, what, what could there possibly be positive about a funeral? And they typically come up with, this, with the same or similar answers, um, which is, you know, the people. The people show up to support you and wrap around like a burrito with love. And many of them may have come miles that you haven't seen in years. And it can be like a big gathering of people who just, you know, haven't seen each other in years. And that's 
just so important, you know, to have that support and also memories. Typically people are saying very positive things, you know, usually about the person who passed and, um, you know, reminiscing and all the good memories. And so lots of good stuff can come out of a, of a funeral, even when it's, it's such an, a tragic event. So this person focusing on the negative really has a tough time with finding the good in, in anything, any situation. Okay, ant species four. Okay, so this person is the catastrophizer. This person um, just thinks of the worst possible scenario. So let's say you have a presentation next week. You could be in middle school, maybe even older elementary school, okay, middle school, high school, college, and or a professional. Because as professionals, I know we do presentations a lot. I have one next week, actually. And you think, oh, no. You know, my presentation just isn't going to go well. There aren't going to be enough, a lot of people there, or the, the opposite. There are going to be so many people there. If I look up into the audience, I'm probably going to pass out, kind of a full blown panic attack. What if I stutter? What if I lose my spot? What if the tech stuff doesn't work? And I can't use my PowerPoint. What if I use my PowerPoint and it doesn't work? And, I, and I, then I get nervous and I can't find my place. What if the CEO walks through at the exact time that everything's caving in on me? What if, what if, what if, what if, catastrophize, catastrophize, catastrophize? Right. What if I'm up for a promotion and then it flops right before my promotion? Um, that, what if this sinks my grade? D -d 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 -d. So they spend up sort of they spend time sort of preparing for the worst, just the worst possible thing. Or if there's a conflict with somebody, maybe it's not even a conflict. Maybe it's just a meeting and they're turning it into a conflict. Maybe it's with a boss, and you know they predict that it's going to go this way. They don't like me. They're going to promote the other person. So the professor, they, I, what do they want to talk to me about it? It can't be that they just saw an internship that you might be ideal for. It has to be, you know, something you're not doing right in class, that sort of thing. And the reality is that most of these things they're catastrophizing about rarely happen. So those valuable minutes are just circling the drain, never to be had again. Okay, ant species, remember, automatic negative thought. Ant species number five is the mind reader. Um, this one, I often use the couples as an example, too, but it doesn't have to be. It can be best friends, roommates, partners, colleagues, you know, adult parents, granny. It can be anybody. Um, this happens when the person believes that they, that they know what the other person is thinking and feeling. So this is why I often use couples, because we know exactly what they're thinking, don't we? They come in with a look, and when they think, oh, they're pissed off at me, or this is because... So-and-so told them whatever, and I knew they'd stick their nose in, and now they're all pissed because of blah, 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 blah. And but we haven't asked them. We don't know. They have that face on. They have that look. They must be pissed or jealous or whatever it is. And since we don't stop to ask, they could have had a fender bender on the way home. They could have not eaten all day because they forgot to bring their lunch, forgot their wallet, and didn't want to be embarrassed and ask anybody, so they have a low, bl low blood sugar. We don't know. And if we bring in texting to the situation – this one cracks me up sometimes with students because when they're texting, it's like all bets are off. They will be talking to someone. And for those of you who are not fluent in teenager and young adult, that means messaging, text messaging, not actually talking, text messaging. They call it talking. And this is sort of the precursor to becoming a thing, which is a couple, in case you don't know. So I'll say, oh, I've been talking to so-and-so for a few weeks. Then all of a sudden, so-and-so doesn't answer the text. And they can tell if you read it, okay? So that if they did read it, it's, oh, no, they don't like me anymore. They're going to break up with me, ba 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 ba, ba. Um, If they don't read it, it might be the same thing. They didn't answer the text or ignoring me. Maybe they blocked me. It can't be that their phone is dead, that they spontaneous decided to go get a spontaneous decided to go get a pizza, or they're having a root canal, and, or they're in class, and the professor, who I am definitely that person, has them with their technology shut off. It can't be any of that. It has to be they don't like you anymore and uh, they want to break up with you. So we're mind reading even through a text message machine. <laughs> Ant species number six is thinking with your feelings. This is my personal favorite. So uh, this is when we believe our negative, our negative, whatever our negative feelings is. I guess they don't have to be negative. We're talking about auto -negative, automatic negative thoughts. So we can believe positive ones too. However, this is not the topic of our discussion today because we don't, it's not the positive feelings and thoughts we usually have trouble with. So thinking with our negative feelings like anger, jealousy, 
um, just think of frustration with somebody, whatever it is, without ever questioning them, without fact-checking. So we turn feelings into facts, which they are not. And when we turn feelings into facts in our head, the, the feelings and facts in our head then become the truth for all people, which we know isn't accurate. We don't always know it isn't ac accurate. It is not accurate. We tend to believe um, our feelings turn into facts are the truth for all people. And so uh, though anyone can do this, we all do this, neurotypicals, and the rest of us neurodiverse. I know as, an, as a, a card-carrying member of the Fast Mind Club with my ADHD, thinking with your feelings, especially if you have the impulsivity component, which I do, um, we tend to get, we're tend to, we tend to be, you know, have our black belt, I guess, in thinking with feelings. And um, what we really have to work on, all of us, not just those of us in the Fast Mind Club, is learning to hit the pause button, you know, so that system two thought process has a chance to kick in, which is our sort of more Sherlock Holmesy, slowed down, observant, gathering the facts, such, you know, kind of circumstances. Because when we slow it down and think, which we can only do when we hit the pause button, you know, duck into a restroom, round the corner, something, we are let, we are apt to be less reactive, like knee jerky and respond in, sorry, reacting to somebody and more of a response. So reacting is a quick knee jerk, right? Doesn't usually go well for us. Whereas a response is a slowed down, more Sherlock Holmesy, um, gather the facts situation. Ant species number eight is uh, labeling. So we can label people in all sorts of ways. We can label them with the, the various mental health labels. We can also la label them with other things like siblings. Oh, she just got her way again because she's so spoiled and She's always been dad's favorite and, or she's always been mom's favorite, dad's and dad's favorite or whatever. Um, oh, or he's, he's so arrogant. He's such an elitist. Of course he was going to say that at the cocktail party right in front of everyone and embarrass me. So it can't be that, you know, we walked in halfway through the conversation and whatever he was responding to was appropriate because the person was annoying or, or maybe saying something that wasn't okay. Who knows? Another example that, and I like to use the ADHD one just because it's easy, a kid is, is sitting in elementary, middle school, whatever, and, and each time the teacher turns around, the kid behind her just like starts jabbing her with the eraser part of the pencil or, or tickling her or just, you know, say, whispering things or whatever. And the kid in front with the ADHD is actually doing very well to be patient with this annoying kid behind her. And uh, the teacher's missing it. So eventually the teacher, you know, turns around and catches the kid saying, knock it off. And it's up. Oh, there, go, there goes her ADHD again. She just can't refrain from saying something to so-and-so. It couldn't be that the kid behind her was uh, was being an annoying little brat, right? I just labeled myself. I think it's because I've had that experience. Okay. Um, ant species number nine, blaming. So it's, it, blaming is just not a great thing to do. I mean, obviously, when things are legit and we can say, oh, so-and-so didn't follow through, baby, 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 calmly, when we just kind of have a habit of blaming other people, it just doesn't usually go anywhere good. You know, it's not taking accountability. And it's also not taking accountability to continually blame ourselves. I mean, it's good to, to, to let ourselves know when we messed up because we all do. And at the same point, it's to just sort of perpetually take the blame like a martyr is ironically also um, not taking accountability. And it sounds crazy because, oh, well, we're taking the blame for everything. But, yeah, but we take the blame. We're not really doing anything about it. It's just, oh, poor me. It's my fault again. And that isn't, that isn't taking accountability at all and doesn't, isn't, you know, overly healthy. So those are the nine ants. So when I uh, do this activity with my Minecrafters, my college students, and then again with professionals sometimes... Again, also a good activity for those of you out there who work with kids. Work, It'll work for them, too. They love to color and make their ants. So um, what they do is they draw an ant, and uh, I hand out a thing that gives them like a little bit of a cartoony picture in case they want to copy it. So you have them color the ant however they want to and have them pick one, you know, one through nine, and most students pick more than one, and also some of them go together. They might just go together for you. Uh, but sometimes, they, like, guilt and blame can go together. You know, the, the guilt beatings thing, that's the person who really beats themselves up. Um, 
Oh, I think I, well, how did I forget that one? I think I did. Okay, backtrack. I feel like I didn't do the guilt one. Anyway, if I did or didn't, we're going to say it again. Labeling. I feel like I did not do the guilt one. I did not do the guilt one. Okay, so ant number eight, we're, re, we're regrouping here, is the guilt beatings one. So guilt has a purpose, which is to keep ourselves from spreading vicious rumors, punching people in the schnozzy, slashing people's tires, you know, whatevs. And hopefully we... Uh, you know, we don't do these things. It'll make us feel badly. And then if we do say something unkind by accident, we're tired, caught off guard, whatever, we're crispy that day, maybe. Then we, you know, apologize, fix it, extend some kindness, whatever like that, right? Guilt held, held on to for too long is also not good. It can be crippling. So we're, you were meant to let that stuff go. Forgive, forgive, let go, move on. And so this person who does the guilt beatings... Um, is just very hard on themselves. Very, very hard on themselves. So I apologize for miss, missing that. So that was before the labeling one. Okay, so guilt was number seven. Labeling was number eight. And then um, blame was number nine. So where we're going with that is some of them go together. Um, and again, it doesn't matter if they technically go together or, or if they just go together for you. That's totally fine. Um, I tell you, two years ago, right before the Rona, I had this guy just, I usually have great classes. They're just excellent. I had one group of students who, there were a bunch, like five or six students said, professor, is it okay if I have all nine of them? I said, well, of course it is what it is. And they sat there and just drew their hands. They usually are sprawled over the floor with, I have a huge bucket of markers and crayons and colored pencils. And they, and I put meditation music on in the background and they come up with some of the most creative ants, sometimes finishing them when they go back to the dorm and then bringing them back to show us because they're amazing. And then at the end of this class, we go around and share them, even if they're not finished. And so the ant, the, co- the cartoon ant, the colored ant, they put a cartoon bubble. And let's say it's the always thinking ant. They'll say something like, you know, um, uh, my anxiety, my anxiety always gets the best of me in these situations. Maybe it's a test or maybe it's dating or whatever. And so the raid can, we, then we have a raid, which is the talk back hand. That also gets a cartoon, you know, balloon of dialogue. I've also had a student use a work boot once, a very detailed work boot to squish his aunt. So either the work boot or the raid can or whatever has a, has a, an example of what they could use to talk back to it. So my there goes my anxiety again. My anxiety always gets the best of me, you know, uh, in, 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 my, in the beginning of a relationship, let's say that. So we're going to fact check and say, okay, always goes back to that every minute of every day thing. And it also, th- that's, it's just a hundred percent. So it's not really statistically possible. So rather than go there, we can say, wait a minute, fact check. Um, we know that that isn't possible, that it's, it's all the time. So it might just be that we are feeling anxious when in the beginning of dating someone. So uh, maybe I should take a look at that and talk to someone about it uh, and, and go from there. Maybe a professional. Another example with the mind reading. Let's say it's a little kid who says, um, I just know he doesn't like me. I know he doesn't like me. Right? Well, do, do let's take that apart for a second. Do we know he doesn't like you or you think he doesn't like you? So we break that down. What did he say to you? And the kid says, well, he didn't say anything. Okay, well, how do you know he doesn't like you? Well, because... He did was the way he, he looked at me. He doesn't sit by me at lunch. And just break all that down because we will mo- more than likely find that there are very few, if any, facts there. So the raid can and the work boot, if you want to go that route, are, are you know, um, a sentence or two that talks back to whatever the ants are you chose. It's an excellent activity to use with little kids, big kids, you know, teenagers, young adults who are college students, and also um, professional grown-ups. So excellent. Thank you for listening. Uh, this is a great place to end and we will, uh, gather soon. I got another one in my head for this weekend. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from Northern Vermont. Have a mindful day.